Hello everyone, welcome along to the next part of our Bible study in the book of Hebrews. We're on chapter 7 tonight, the second part of chapter 7. So as we come to look at it, let's pause and let's pray together. Father, again we come to you giving you thanks for all your goodness to us, for your provision, for your protection. Lord, just for your presence with us each and every day. Uh, thank you for that blessing which you have given to us. Lord, as we come now to look at your words, we pray that you would help us, help us to be able to understand your word, help us to be challenged by it, as well as encouraging us through your word. And just, Lord, through this, as we think about it, may it bring us closer to you today and each day. Father, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So yet we're on the second half of Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, let me read to you just from verse 15 through to the end. Uh, a couple of verses, so bear with me, we'll read this together. And again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This change has been made very clear um, ever since a different priest, who is like Melchizedek, has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out whenever he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. But the law never made anything perfect. But now we have a confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honour in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer, offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sin. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weaknesses. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. Amen. If you cast your mind back to last week, or if you've watched it again recently, um, you'll remember we were talking about how Jesus is likened to someone in the Old Testament called Melchizedek, who was both king and priest, and how that in itself is an image which speaks of Jesus as being king, as being God, and as also being our priest, the person who intercedes for us, the person who offers the sacrifice for us. Um, so that's why it starts off by saying this change has been made clear ever since a different priest has appeared. So Jesus changed the old order of things. Again, something which is clear whenever you read the Last Supper, whenever you read anything around it, when it says, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new oath, a new promise through his body and his blood. And this, is priest, this, this passage refers to that quite a lot. It says Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. A priest had to come from a certain tribe. Only those who came from the tribe of Levi were priests. And that was their calling. That was their duty. That was how they served God and served their people. But now Jesus is made priest and he's not from the tribe of Levi, he's from the tribe of Judah, the house of David. Um, but he has a life that cannot be destroyed as it puts it here in Hebrews. He is different. 
Um, if you think about Christ, if you think about uh, whenever he, he died, it said that Christ gave up his life. So it wasn't taken from him. He gave it up freely for us. And then he is raised to that new life uh, whenever he's raised again uh, to become the one who sits at God's right hand on our behalf and who, as the Bible puts it, intercedes. So he says to God, no, they are covered by my blood. Whenever we are accused, he stands and defends us. You know, that, that's the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. Jesus is eternal. Um, again, part of that is because of the fact that he is God. Uh, you think of God as three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God lives forever. Jesus lives forever. The Holy Spirit lives forever. God cannot be destroyed. So we have an eternal high priest. Something which we come to later on in this passage as well. Something which shows just how different Jesus is. And again, the writer of Hebrew underlines this with scripture. He talks about the psalmist in verse 17. And he quotes from Psalm 110 verse 4 when he says, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Again, the writer of Hebrews talks about how Melchizedek, we don't know his parentage, we don't know when he was born, we don't know when he, was di when he died. And that's seen as a prophecy towards Jesus. Obviously Melchizedek did, was born, did live, did die um, because he was a human being. Um, we're not told that he was one of those people who was caught up to heaven without dying. Um, so he must have, but from the point of view of records, we don't have that. And that's why it's seen as a prophecy again of Christ. Verse 18 goes on to say, Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. Imagine calling it weak and useless. You know, you talk about God's law and what God has established. But the next verse goes on to say, For the law never made anything perfect. You know, and this, this is the point of what we would call the Ten Commandments, or words of wisdom, if you want to translate it in a literal sense. Um, in that the Ten Commandments and the law which is given to God's people in the Old Testament, there is never any way that they're going to keep all of that. There's no way that they're going to live a sinless life because like you and I, they're human beings and they're going to fall and they're going to fail. But the law shows us God's perfect standard. It shows us what he would aspire us to be, what he would want us to be, if we could be perfect. But we can't. We never will be while we live on earth. We can only be perfect once we actually go into heaven to be with him. So that's why the priesthood was weak and useless, because the priesthood was run by people who are human beings, and it's administered by those who are human beings. Again, something we, we come on to at the end of the passage. And it just shows us how flawed we are. So the law never made anything perfect. In fact, the law only points out to us our flaws. But verse 19 goes on to say, but now we have a confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. Again, that phrase, better hope, um, in our time now, we can misunderstand that. We often talk about hope from, oh, I hope this happens, or I hope everything will be okay. Hope is nearly uh, like, like wishing, uh, uh, and it's, mm, will it or won't it? But Bible hope is an assurance, it's a promise, it's something that will happen. Um, so we have confidence in a better hope, or we have confidence in a, in a promise through which we draw near to God. And again, it shows us just how Jesus brings us close to Christ, how he opens up that path, how it's not reliant upon us. Thank goodness for that. But we simply rely on what Jesus has done for us. Just think of yourself today, even think about the sort of day you've had so far. Think about what so far you've done right. Think about what so far you've done wrong. It shows you how flawed we are. So thank goodness this doesn't depend upon us, but rather it depends upon God and his promises. Verse 20 goes on to say, this new system was established with a solemn oath. God made a promise to us. 
It says, Aaron's, Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there was an oath regarding Jesus. And then again, it goes on to quote Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Jesus is never going to be removed from that position. Jesus is the only one who possibly could have that position. That's why verse 22 says, because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. Again, maybe we lose a sense of that word guarantee. You know, when we go out and buy something in the shop, it comes with a, a guarantee. But it's a limited guarantee. You know, if you buy an electrical goods, uh, it's, it's a one-year guarantee or 12 months warranty, as we talk about. And you can buy an extended warranty. We don't have to buy an extended warranty with God. We don't have to buy a better guarantee. We have the ultimate guarantee, which is that Christ has died for our sins and that if we trust him, we are forgiven. Our sins are covered. Again, as the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, has the Lord removed our sins from us? Now, if you think about that, as far as the east is from the west... If you keep going east, you will never reach west. If you keep going west, you will never reach east. It just doesn't happen. And then, you know, that, that's how much God promises and guarantees us um, that we have a high priest who through him our sins are forgiven. It goes on to say in verse 23, there were many priests under the old system for death prevented them from re remaining in office. Yeah, we are flawed, we are frail, and, and our human lives are short-lived. Um, we quite often forget that at times. We, we think that we can live forever. We think that we should live forever. Uh, we think that we are guaranteed to live forever. In human terms, we're not. Yes, our soul lives on. And again, that's why Paul in Corinthians running talks about how whenever we give up the tent of this body, um, how our soul lives on and, and we, we long for the new body whenever we are raised again with Christ. And that's what matters. You know, the, these bodies that we look at and we, and we see, we, we know they're flawed. We see what goes wrong with them. But our soul which dwells inside is the part that lives on, the part that matters. So yes, there was many priests under the old system because they lived in flawed bodies which existed for so long and then they died. But Jesus, and says, but because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Jesus will never be replaced. Jesus will always sit at God's right hand. Jesus will always intercede for us. And one day we will get to be in his presence. That's the amazing thing. It says about Jesus in verse 5, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Uh, that word save, that phrase, you can also interpret it um, or is able to save completely those who come to God um, through him. If you think of it that way, those are able to save completely. You know, again, this is hinted at and this is reflected upon later on. Um, when God forgives us through Christ, it's complete forgiveness. Now that's forgiveness for sins past and sins future if we open up our lives and let him in then he forgives us completely it's letting him in that's what matters um you know we can say any words under the sun uh, you you get different things with what well, get different words which are written which you call a prayer of salvation uh, and you know people say oh say these words and, and everything's fine it's not about saying words. Our salvation is about letting God into our lives. That's why everyone's journey into faith is unique and different. That's why for some people that journey into faith is something quick, something memorable for them. For others, it's a journey over time. But during that journey then, they open their heart's door, as we say, and let God in. It, 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 another way of putting it is we surrender ourselves to God. Um, 
A really good way, it, it's been used before, uh, and a really good image is thinking of a boat. As a boat journeys and it goes into different docks and different ports, um, ports and docks are built in such a way that they can be very dangerous. There are hidden dangers below the surface. There can be hidden currents, sandbanks, obstacles. So a lot of the time, whenever you come near a port or a channel, uh, a boat has to take on board a pilot. Somebody who knows the waters, somebody who can navigate the waters. And that pilot comes on board that ship and steers that ship in and out of port and then leaves again. In life, we always need a pilot. In life, without a pilot, we just wander the seas aimlessly of life. But when we have a pilot on board, we have purpose, we have fulfillment, we have someone to guide us and direct us. And that image is of Christ as our pilot, as God guiding us and directing us. So whenever we realise that we need a pilot, whenever we realise our need, that we are standing at the helm, at the, at the wheel of our ship, and we don't know what way to go, and we then put out a call for a pilot, and we let God into our lives. Once he's with us, he never leaves us. Yes, at times we think we know better, and we argue with our pilot, and maybe we even try to snatch the, the wheel from our pilots and take control of the ship ourselves. God doesn't let go of us. He might sort of step back and say, okay, you think you can guide the ship better? Where you go. But he's still on board. He is still um, there watching what we do, waiting for the moment whenever we actually realise, okay, God, I've made a mess of this. And then he simply puts his hands on top of ours and says, let me guide you. You know, I, I love that image um, of a pilot and what it means. So God always is with us. It says that through Christ, we are completely forgiven. And our lives, it goes on to say, he, he lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. So Jesus always speaks on our behalf once we let him in. It says he's the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless unstained by sin we, we sometimes forget that sometimes whenever we look at the human jesus we forget about the fact that he was also the holy jesus or jesus as the son of god he's very unique never seen before never to be repeated again god in flesh as we would sometimes say you know we're coming up to christmas time whenever we think about um the birth of christ uh, you know, Christmas is about presence and, and Christ was the present or the gift given to us so that we would have forgiveness of sins. But he came fully human to suffer as a human being would, to feel what a human being would, but also to be God, to be unstained by sin. It says he's been set apart from sinners to be given the highest, pla highest place of honour in heaven. Or another way of translating it, has been exalted higher than the heavens. Jesus has the highest place of honour, sitting at God's right hand. But this is the bit that really shows us how perfect he is. Verse 27 onwards. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this first for, for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. So a priest, before he started his priestly duties for the day, a priest came and offered a sacrifice to God, asking for the forgiveness of his own sins, recognising that he will have said or done or acted in a way which is not what God wanted. So there is sin in his own life. He had to do this every day before he could serve in front of God and offer sacrifices for others. And maybe during the day he would have done the same again because maybe he snapped at somebody and shouted at them. Maybe he fell out with them. And he really realised that before he would come again to God to offer sacrifices for others, he had to again ask forgiveness for himself. Flawed. But Christ isn't like that. He's perfect. 
It says about Jesus, he did this once when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Christ only had to die once for all of us, for all of our sins. You know, it would be easy to think that every time we ask for forgiveness, we're re-crucifying Christ, but that would be wrong. That would mean that Christ's sacrifice is not enough. It's a bit like as well, um, we're in the past before, you know, we, we, we've said, you know, we have to, to, to work our way through salvation and, and work forgiveness of sins. That's like saying that Christ's sacrifice is not enough to forgive us our sins. That's why we believe very firmly that whenever we die, we do go to be with God because he has forgiven our sins through Christ. It's so important to realise that Christ's sacrifice is complete and it's the only complete sacrifice. It never needs to be repeated. It completely saves us. Verse 28, the law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness, but after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. You know, we sometimes again in life think that we have to do certain things to make ourselves right with God. No matter how hard we try, we'll never do that. Um, no matter how much we put in an effort, it will never be enough because our actions are always flawed. We can't work our way through uh, life or through an afterlife to finally get into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Our actions aren't good enough. In fact, to try and work our way through an afterlife, like I said, would, would, would mean that Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. But it is. Christ's sacrifice is complete. It's all that we need for the forgiveness of our sins. He is the perfect priest. You know, that again, we might struggle with that view of priesthood and sacrifices because we don't have that. Because it's something foreign to us that we don't live with. But when you just think about it, when you think about what those people did for forgiveness of sins, and then you think about what we have to do, for us it is so much simpler. We just have to let God into our lives, and yet we continue to fight against that. Even when we have done that, we still try to take control. We just need to let God be in control. We just need to let God guide us and direct us, and he's always with us. God is never going to go away and leave us. God is never going to turn his back on us. And I think, oh, I've had enough of you, where you go. He's not like that. He is forever with us because Christ is forever our high priest. You know, that should be a reassuring thought, especially in these days when everything is so difficult, to realise that God will always, always be with us, always help us, always guide us, Never let us go. I just pray that you would know that peace from God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your constant presence with us, that you are and your son is our eternal high priest. Lord, just help us always to trust you, to give it all over to you, surrender to you, and let you guide us in all things. Father, thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, folks, for listening. Uh, God bless and see you again next week. Bye.